Good afternoon. We're going to practice logic circuits some more today. We have our homework number two is due on Friday, which is tomorrow. So we have already talked about everything that is on that homework. Uh, but we'll do a little bit more to review today. Uh, before we start that, are there any questions? Okay, so we're going to do um, a practice problem where I'm going to give you uh, some criteria for making a circuit, and then we're going to try to build the truth table, write uh, a logic equation for it, and then build circuits for it. All right, so let's say um, we have an alarm system. And we have sensors. on doors and windows and on uh, a fire alarm. And we can, we're going to call that D, W, and F. And so if something's open, do you think we should have a 0 or a 1 for the symbol? So if one of these is open or on, so if if it's on, we're going to give it a what? A 1. Good. That's what I would choose. Okay? So uh, let's make an output for this. So if one of these is uh, going off, we might want to have um, two different things you do. So let's say we want to build a system that will call your cell phone for some of them and will call uh, the fire department for other ones. So which one do you want to call your cell phone for? Call your cell phone for any of them? For which one do we want to call the fire department? The fire alarm. One F is true, right? And um, what if you have a security company? Which ones do you want to call for? Which ones? You really, you're going to have to pay every time they send somebody out. You want to call them for, if a door is open? Maybe a window? How about doors and windows together? Okay, so these are going to be three different outputs we want. Okay, so we need three different functions uh, as outputs for our three inputs. So the first thing we need to do is make a truth table that shows when we need to do each thing. So let's make a truth table with DW and F as our inputs. And M is going to be for calling me. And we're going to call FD for calling the fire department. And we're going to call S for calling the security department, security company. Of course, my numbers are getting smaller and smaller. OK, so I want you to fill this out given the requirements we just wrote for when each of these should make a call. Did anyone get done and disagree with their neighbor about what some of the circuits were, some of the requirements? Okay, several of your, you are raising your hands, and I get some nodding without raising hands. Um, this is normal for requirements. And this is like one of the simplest things you could possibly do. So imagine any computer program has the same problem, is that all of us read things and we assume different things. 
Um, if I have written a question on the exam unclearly, I will take all of them as correct answers. Um, and then as you do the consecutive things, uh, that'll be fine. Um, so, and also if you can, even if I mark it wrong, if you can make a convincing argument that what you have interpreted as should be correct, I will mark it as correct. I have to be convinced, but, you know, you always take a chance when you argue about score that something else will get reduced. You know that. Okay, good. Okay, so um, we want to call our cell phone if anything bad was happening. So it was basically all the time, except for as if nothing was going on. All right, we're going to call the fire department only when F was true. Okay, and we were going to call the security company. Some of This is the one that some of you disagreed on. Uh, I actually said when uh, door and window were on, but some people uh, wanted to do door or window. So that ends up giving us ones there. So each of you would have paid for different levels of security from your security company. <laughs> so they are actually both valid answers. Uh, so we're just going to do, so this is, this is the expensive one. And this is going to be the cheap one. And we're going to do the cheap one. Why are we going to do the cheap one? Because it has fewer ones in it. Okay, any questions about that before we start making some circuits? Yes. <laughs> Do you pay for a security company right now? Do you pay for a security company? Company? Does anyone in here pay for a security company? Okay, so you wouldn't pay for either one of them. So I guess in your imaginary world that we get maximum when we pay. Okay? It's not, it doesn't work like that. It costs like, you know, $200 a month for one of them and $30 a month for the other one. Okay, so we need to build some circuits for these. And we're just going to build the S one because it has two ones. It's going to be a lot easier. Um, M is a pain, right? It's not too much of a pain, but it would be a pain in do, to do in disjunctive normal form, right? So that's the kind of problem I'll give you on the test, is I'll ask you to do it in disjunctive normal form. I'm not going to give you one that has seven ones in it. Okay, I'll give you one that has four, probably. So the fire department one, though, is really obvious. Like, I don't actually need to use disjunctive normal form because I can just use F, right? And that's not even circuit. So we're not going to do that one. Let's just do the cheap S. Okay, so for our cheap S, we have to look at the state of the world for each of the rows. So in uh, this case, we have D and W and not F. And in this case, we have D, W, and F. So if the problem asks you to write it in disjunctive normal form, you need to write it even if you already know what a reduced version of it looks like. How many of you know what the reduced version of this looks like? It should be a lot more of you because I actually wrote it right there. Okay, good. Now everybody knows what it looks like, right? Okay, now I know how many people are listening. Okay, so we had we had DWF or DW not F. That's our disjunctive normal form. So again, that means disjunctive stands for the main operator between these terms, and the terms are multiplications, which are ands. Um, so now if we want to draw the circuit for this, it's very fast. We make two, three input AND gates. Put a knot where, where there's a knot. 
connect it up to an OR. And that's our circuit after we label our inputs. Okay, now the next kind of problem I would do is ask you to um, make the same circuit, but only with OR gates. So I want you to try that on your paper real quick. Make it only with OR gates. You, there are two main approaches. One is to remember the secret life of AND gates and draw a little OR gate inside that has all of the inputs what? Negated and all of the outputs negated. Or you can do De Morgan's on this if you like. Okay, so then we basically erase the end gates so we get There's our three OR gates. Another way to draw this, if you had the knots on the back of the uh, last OR gate, would also be equivalent. And it would be easy to change this, the original one, into something that was all ANDs, right? By just changing this OR into an OR gate that has the inputs negated and the output negated. That's what De Morgan does. So De Morgan's flips all of the inputs and changes the operator. And it flips the output, too. OK, so what was the hardest part of that exercise we just did? OK, some people said none of it. Anybody? Yes. Not reducing it. OK. What else? Usually the hardest part of any of this is understanding the specifications. So making sure you read the problem correctly. So try to do, make sure that you read the problem and build the circuit that's asked for. Okay, you won't lose a lot of credit if you don't get it exactly right. If you write down reasonable assumptions, you'll be okay. All right, any questions about this whole process? So reducing is easy with this one, right? So if I reduce this, what am I doing? Um, I had a comment over here. What was it? I'm putting it in simple terms, but basically I'm going to look at this and see how to reduce it. So what am I looking for? I can factor the DW out. So just like I would do factoring in math, I can factor out things in logic. So when I do, I have to leave what's in the terms there. Try not to skip too many steps when you're doing your reductions. Um, because it's very easy to skip a step and think that you had a zero somewhere or an or somewhere and then get a zero or one somewhere that you didn't actually get. So don't skip anything. Um, just write it out. Factor it and write it out. And then what's F or not F? That's logically equivalent to one. So we get DW times one and that's going to be equal to DW. So now we're done. I can tell that that is done because I don't see any repeated variables. I don't see any opposite variables. I don't see anything that simplifies down to one or zero. And I don't have any knots anywhere. So sometimes if I have knots, like multiple knots, I might be able to make something simpler if I use De Morgan's. Okay, and what's the circuit look like for this? It's a single gate with a D and a W. And this is our cheap S.
All right, so let's look at some, uh, just some reductions without uh, starting from uh, a circuit description. Um, there is, by the way, uh, if you haven't actually looked at the packets online on your Moodle um, site, on Moodle there are note packets. And actually there are some extra handouts about um, circuit reduction. So you should actually definitely go on Moodle. Like most of the time you're probably not going there. You're probably going to Piazza and WebAssign. But um, there are some extra things there. So um, definitely go there because what I've done is I did some extra circuit reduction problems and I put them on a PDF and you can see uh, several examples worked. Um, that's always good for uh, practice. So you could pull that out, write it down on a piece of paper, try to work it and then see how it compares with what I've got. Um, so I recommend that. Also, your book um, has a great, uh, some great examples and description for um, for the logic circuits. And in packet two, um, we have I think it's packet two starts our next section, which is going to be predicate calculus, um, but it also has uh, an example adder circuit. So how many people know what an adder is? Okay. How many people don't know what an adder is? Okay. Well, let's just do it. So just make sure you take a look at those. Packet 1 has notes up to now. Packet uh, and, and a little bit beyond. Packet 2 has some on uh, an adder. But also Packet 2 has some uh, test 1 review problems. And that includes some worked proofs. So if you're having any trouble with proofs, make sure that you print out packet two and take a look at that because it has several worked proofs, so by direct and indirect methods. Also, there are, there are recordings of this, of this same class that I taught at NC State in 2002 on iTunes University. So if you need a different way of presentation than that I've given before, you can you can look for those. Okay, so an adder is a circuit that's really important in a computer. So the way a computer works to do anything is that we have um, memory that keeps stuff we want to mess with, and we have um, registers that keep data that we're working with right now. And we have an arithmetic logic unit that will let me add numbers into registers. So that's really like the basic parts of your computer. And you have a CPU that decides like what instructions to do at what time. So um, what I need to be able to do is add two numbers. It's one of the most fundamental things that I have to do on my computer. Um, because I need to add things to get relative addresses, I need to add things to do multiplication. Um, we have to do addition all the time. So it's the basic. Um, root of most of our computation. Okay, so it has to be done bit by bit. So one idea is I need to, the most basic adder will add to one digit binary numbers. Okay, so let's make two one-digit binary numbers. So just like anything else, we will have a four-row truth table for this. And we'll have a sum that is the output of this. So if I add 0 plus 0, what do I get? If I add 0 plus 1, what do I get? If I add 1 plus 1, what do I get? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you guys to vote for three different numbers. How many people vote for zero? Okay, good. How many people vote for one? Okay. How many people vote for two? How many people vote for all of them? Okay, I vote for all of them because it depends on what, what you're asking, right? So it's not a very specific question, right? What is the output of B1, 
the addition of 1 plus 1? Well, the in base 10, the answer is 2. And in base anything other than 1, the answer is 2. Right? Or base 2. Any, any base other than 2, the answer is 2. So if I have base 3, the answer is still 2. So 1 plus 1 is actually equal to 2, but it's in decimal, right? But our output's going to be in binary, so this is actually equal to 1, 0 in binary, right? So that's why this is correct, because the digit that is in the left, sorry, in the rightmost place in an addition is the 0, right? So actually that's what we put in this column, but we have to do what? We have to carry... And that's what this one is, so that's why this is a correct answer also. So everybody was right. It just depends on what question you were answering. Now, if you weren't answering the question that I gave that went with that number, then maybe you should go look at your packets some more. Okay, so we need to carry bit two, which we maybe didn't realize when we started this problem. So there's actually two outputs for addition, even though we're only adding binary numbers that only have two choices each. So the carry, we didn't need it for anything but this last one. Now this looks weird because I would rather my output actually look like the correct order, right? So this is backwards, so it would be cool if I just rewrite S over here. And then I can ignore this one. And now this looks like the actual um, digits, the two digits of the sum. That's the output, right? So if I consider C as the next column over, so like if I added 1 and 1 in like the old standard format, and this is in binary, then we get that. And then this ends up being S, and that ends up being C. So we have S is the rightmost bit, and C is the carry. Now, making a circuit for this is easy. So the hard part of this problem was is that most of you didn't know what an adder was. So then even after I told you that it's a circuit that gives me the output if I add two digits, you might not have known that we needed two outputs. Okay, so you're going to face problems like this, and you have to think through it and figure out what your assumptions are. And then make a truth table and figure out a circuit. Now, there are many ways to uh, make the circuits for these. Um, but before we make the circuit, let's make this problem more complex, because how often do I just do this? Not often because I normally have more than one column of things to add, right? And when I'm in the middle of a problem, I have to take that carry bit and put it on the top, right? So this is actually called a half adder. Because it's actually not solving the whole problem. Because the whole problem that I could solve for all the columns of addition is if I had three inputs and one of them is a carry from a prior addition. Right, so if I went one column over, I could put the carry in here and then I could have some digits in the second column. And then if I had an adder that would do three numbers as inputs, then that would solve, I could do the entire adder for however many digits I wanted by stringing them together. Okay, so let's do a full adder. So a full adder has to have a carry it has a digit, and it has two digits to add. We have to have a carry out, and we have to have a sum digit. So we make our truth table like we normally do. And then all we have to do is figure out what the sum digits, sum and carry digits are. Very easy when everything's zeros. And addition is has a property that's either associative or commutative. Which is it? It has both, right? Associative means it doesn't, if I want to do three things, it doesn't matter which pair I do first. And commutative means it doesn't matter which, which order. So if I'm going to add these, 
I can just look across and say, oh, there's just one one, so that is one carry a zero. There's just one one, that's one carry a zero. There's two ones, so that's two, which is zero carry a one. So when you're working these problems, you want to do it in a way that makes sense for you. And I'm going to do one more thing, and then I'll answer your question. So I could have actually put the decimal output here. This is the truth table, and I'm using it for my own good. Sorry. Talking and writing at the same time is not working today. I'm hearing some corrections, but I'm the fourth row. Oh, okay. That should be a two. The fourth row should be a two. Okay, good. Thank you for catching that. So I could have written a decimal. And that would also just help me do my truth table faster, right? So I can write whatever I want on my truth table because it's a shorthand for me to write down things that are true in each row. So you can write that. It's totally legal to do that. You had a question. Yes, I have to add up all three digits, right? When I do regular addition and I have a carry bit, a carry something from the previous number, I have to add it just like all the other numbers. Let's do it. When I add these numbers, I get 11, 1 carry the 1. You add the 1 with the 5 and the 9, I get 15, carry the 1. Yes? Regular addition? Okay. So we always add the carry. Like, we don't care that it's a carry. We just add it. Same thing with binary. It works the exact same way. Does that answer your question? Okay, so now we need to make circuits for these. So let's look back at our half adder. Our half adder, these two columns look exactly the same as the first half of this table. Right? So we could use we could use something from there. Um, so actually, basically we're ignoring carry zero. Well that makes sense because the carry zero is zero. So it does look like a half adder in the first half of the table. In the second half of the table, this, can you see anything from S that look, compared to the first half? It's the opposite, right? So whenever we're doing reduction, circuit reduction, like we can just, in order to make a circuit, I can do disjunctive normal form and I'll be guaranteed to get a circuit that's going to work. But I can also be clever and look at parts of my table and use things I know about them to make a simpler, simpler circuit. Does anybody know what function that is? That's exclusive OR, right? This is the opposite of exclusive OR. This is an OR, right? And this is an AND. So let's, let's use our um, human intuition and logic to actually write the circuit for this. But you should practice writing it in disjunctive normal form and drawing a circuit for it just for your own practice for the test because you're going to have to have a problem like this where you might not see a pattern like this. So you need to practice writing things in DNF and writing circuits for them. But we're going to be clever. So to make C, C1, this, this is clearly an AND of two variables. Which two variables? So that's going to be an AND of X and Y. And in the first half of the table, we also have what? We have not C0. So we have to put that in there to make sure that we're only dealing with the first half of the table. On the second half of the table, we have C0 being true. And we know that we're going to OR two things together, and it's going to be X0 and Y0. Because if you look at this part of the table, that's exactly like the truth table just for X and Y together. right? So if we look at the bottom half, it's like a repeat of the top half. 
So I can make any truth table by taking the smaller one and putting zeros in front of it and then replicating the truth table and putting ones in front of that. That's actually what we do. So this is C0 times the quantity X0 plus Y0. And then I can just OR these two things together. If I OR them together, why is that okay? If I didn't put this on there, I couldn't do it, right? So the reason why I can do it is because not C0 is only true in the first half, right? So this function is going to be zeros in the second half. Does everybody see that? This function, C0, is going to be zero in the first half, so it'll have all zeros as the output. So I can OR these two things together and not ruin any of my outputs. That's why breaking your table into pieces according to when one of your variables is zero or one is a great way to deal with it. And you always want to do the leftmost variable for that because that's the one where you can easily see where the split is. So if you have an intuition that one of your table, like one of your variables is going to split your world in half, then put that one on the left and it'll be easiest to find the pattern with that. Okay, so this is our equation for C1. Is that reduced? Most likely, I probably cannot get any better than this. Because there's nothing in common to factor out between these, except for maybe a y0. I doubt it will get less complex if we do anything with it. Okay? So let's do the same thing for s. Okay? In the first half, we decided that that looked like exclusive or, and we know that we're just talking about the last two variables. It wasn't an exclusive or, but now it is. Okay, and The second half is going to be the same thing, but negated. So the output of the exclusive or negated. And then we can OR those two things together. Any questions? Am I going to let you draw a circuit with an exclusive OR in it? No. We need to write the uh, we need to write what exclusive or is with ands and ors. Okay, so we've got a nice circuit here, but we need to actually um, compute the exclusive or uh, with a circuit using ands and ors. So let's figure out how to do that. So this is S one. Any questions about how we got that? Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is make a circuit for exclusive OR. Okay, so the definition of exclusive OR says X or Y, but not both. So I can literally write my equation from that. X plus Y, but actually means and, not both. So let's draw a circuit for that. So there's the not xy. Now I'm going to do something. That's kind of cheap, but you're allowed to do it. That is now my exclusive OR circuit, and now I'm going to reuse it. 
So if I tell you you have to draw something with ants and ors, you can draw it and then use that new circuit that you've drawn. Because that's actually what we do. As engineers, if we're going to make a circuit, we figure out one piece and then we never draw it again because we might make a mistake if we draw it again. Okay, we refer back. Look at this diagram for this thing. And now I'm going to use it whenever I want. And by the way, I'm going to draw it like this. Right? This is the same as in logic. You can make up your own axioms and then name them and use them. So if I tell you you have to use ands and ors, we'll do part of it, and then you can make your own gate and use it again. So let's do that. For S, so we had S1 was equal to not C0. So in order to do this, I need to exclusive or X0 and Y0 together. And I need to end that with not C0. And I also need to negate it and end it with C0. And then I or those two things together to get S. Is this the only way to draw this circuit? No, it is not. You could also calculate the exclusive OR twice. You could have drawn it with the ANDs and OR gates. There are many, many different ways to draw this. On homework two, the last question, um, I know you don't read instructions, so I'm going to tell you what the instructions are so you can forget this also. There's actually a link to a little program called Circuit Builder that will allow you to build circuits, and it will give you the truth table output for it. So I link that just so you can play with an online tool for dragging around gates and having it make circuits for you. So um, if you want practice with that, you can use that tool to actually make some circuits and see what the uh, truth tables are and vice versa. So um, occasionally you should look at the directions and, and try them out or see if there's cool links in them. You're not required to use that. If you, you probably can easily figure out the truth table without doing it. So the instructions say to go use a circuit builder. You don't have to. Um, it was just so I can link, link to something cool for you. If the link is broken, please do let me know, and I'll find something else to link for you. Okay, so now we need to make one for C1. And I'd like you to try that and then check it with your neighbor. All right, let's, let's draw this. Now, um, if this is something new for you, then it really is as easy as it is. So you shouldn't ever sit and look at your paper and go, I don't know what to do. This is an AND of three things. So I draw an AND gate, and I put those three things on there. So it's just as easy as that. So if you don't know where to start, just start with something you can. Okay, and then this is an OR. I can't do this until I have this OR done. And I can't do this OR until I have this term done. So, like if I try to do something, I'm not going to be able to do it unless it's the right thing. So, I can do this OR of X0 and Y0. And then I need to end the output of that with C0. And then these two terms are finished, so now I can OR them together. And by the way, don't connect these lines because they have different values on them. So now this is going to this output would now give me C1. Any questions about that? Now, 
Now, what happens um, after we make circuits like this is we've reduced it. We've made the circuit with ands and ors. Then someone figures out how to make it really tiny and produce a chip for it, and then they reuse it over and over again within a computer. And what they do is after we have a chip for it, we think of it as a black box. So we made our circuit for our exclusive OR, and then now we just use the shorthand for it. So by the way, this isn't two separate gates. It's just an exclusive OR. So I drew it kind of messy. So it usually looks like this, and it just has an extra line on the back. So that is the gate. So that's the picture for what exclusive OR looks like whenever we refer to it. Um, what it does on the inside is this. So when I drew a box, um, that's basically what we do when we, uh, when we draw a box, but we usually don't have the, re the inputs repeated. So what we'll do when we draw a box around something is that if I've repeated the inputs somewhere, I'll actually connect them all up to those inputs, so I only have to put them once into the box. So let's redraw that, how I would do it. I would actually draw the box out here, and then I would have one X and one Y input, and I would connect this X up to here. So I'd probably do my nice lines like you guys do. And connect that in there and connect my Y over here. Okay. Yeah, we just squiggle around. Okay? It's very ugly, I know. Okay, so that's because I was drawing on an existing piece of paper. All right? But now this is my black box. I don't care. Once I figured this out on the inside, I don't care how it works. So now I can treat an exclusive aura as something that just gives me the output I want with X and Y as input and X exclusive or Y as an output, and that's why we can draw this little uh, symbol and use it. And in reality, somebody has done even something more basic than that to build AND and OR gates, right? So we're not even going to talk about how they work. Maybe you'll take a logic course that will tell you how they work, but we're not going to do it. So there's something on the inside. And what is that? That's abstraction. Okay, what we're doing is abstraction. So once we figured out how to do something, we don't do it again. We give it a name and we call that. Now we use work at that level. So we work at different levels of abstraction. That's a really core computer science concept. And so we're kind of using it over and over again. So if I say, well, now I'm going to call this variable this, I'm making another layer of abstraction. So how would I put my adders together in a circuit? So what I would do is... For my sum, I'm going to draw a box around this. And my S bit is going to have these things inside. And to get not C0, I only want to put C0 in here once. So I'm going to have to actually put an inverter in there. Okay, so that's what I would end up with for my S. And in reality, when we build an adder circuit, we're actually going to put both of these circuits on the chip and have two outputs. So I draw a box around this one too, but I don't have any room to even make a messy input and output thing there. So basically what I'm going to end up with, though, is a box. Okay, so I'll have C0 and X0 and Y0 as inputs, and C1 and S1 as outputs. And then if I want to add several columns of things, I need to hook them up together. So let's just do an example. So to add 2 and 3 in binary... That's what this looks like. So I get a 1 in my left digit, sorry, in my right digit, the S for the first adder. So this is my first adder. And then I'm going to have a carry bit place right there for my first adder. And then my second adder will be there, and the output 
will be there. So we're going to we'll get 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1. Okay, so if I want to get this as my um, as a circuit, I'm going to have to draw one for uh, the first bit. Actually, let's put S on the bottom. So we don't have any carry in on the first one, right? There's no carry in on the first column, right? So now we've drawn the circuit. We don't do it anymore. So this is going to be let's label everything. That'll be C0. So we're going to actually have an output here. I actually called it C1, right? That should be C1. And that'll be S1. Okay, so this will be S1 to give me that digit. And I'm going to need my carry to come out, C1. And it's going to have to come in to my next one. So everybody see how we can use those to get our addition to work? So you have to do a similar problem to this on a later homework where you chain multiplexers together, so smaller multiplexers to make bigger ones. So we have to do the same kind of thing with multiple mu multiplexers. So you can make a 3-bit multiplexer with several 2-bit multiplexers. Looks like ooh, looks like the mic's not picking up anymore. Okay, that's better. All right, any questions on this? Who would like to do uh, some more proofs? Do you guys all feel like you can do proofs with no more help? Everybody raise your hand if you don't need any help on proofs. Okay, so is your problem with the word like? Okay. Who needs me to do some more proofs? Okay, there we go. Okay, let's, let's work some more proof problems. Does anyone happen to have a printout of the proof problems from the tutorial? If you do, I'll work some of those. So I'll work problem four is what I want to do. Thank you. We have A or the quantity B implies C. We have B or C. And we have C implies A. All of these are given. Okay, and we want to prove A. Okay, I'd like you to take a second and identify one of the proof lines that has an A on it and set a goal of finding another line that will help me eliminate the other variable from it. So the only thing you're going to do right now is pick a line to work from. So there's three lines. I'm going to ask, does anybody pick number two? Good, because there's no A's on line two, right? Now, should I pick one or three? If you pick one, raise your hand. If you pick three, raise your hand. Okay, why'd you pick three? 
there's only one other variable to eliminate, so it looks easier. I like that reasoning. Okay, so we're going to pick line 3 to work with, and we want to eliminate that C. Okay, now the simplest thing I could do it with is line 2, but it's not quite in a format. I don't have any rules that allow me to combine ORs with implications, right? I, d I just don't. So I'm not going to be able to combine those two lines. So I have to do something to line 2 so I can combine them. So in order to combine them, I need to change line 2 into an implication so that I'll be able to probably use hypothetical syllogism or constructive dilemma with it. One of those two uh, will let me combine two implications, right? That's the only rule that lets me combine implications. So ORs are equivalent to implications, so that's why I thought of doing that. So we're going to use the implication rule on line 2. So we already know we're going to do that. And that means I have to negate the first variable, change the OR to an implication, and copy down the second variable. Now I can combine 3 and 4 with hypothetical syllogism. And that's what my goal was. So the C's overlap in the conclusion of one and the hypothesis of the other, so I can eliminate them. So I got not B implies A. So I still have some pesky other variable on line 5 that isn't A. I need to get rid of it. So I'm definitely going to have to combine with this line 1 because I've already used line 2 and everything else so far. So that's my only choice left. It's messy, but I don't have any other choices. So we have a couple of options here, but the option that we don't have is doing anything with the inside of this parentheses right here. That is not an option because none of our rules allow us to apply, uh, to apply like modus ponens, hypothetical, hypothetical syllogism, anything inside parentheses on the line. It has to be on whole lines. So we can't do it because I can't end these two th things together and do anything with these implications. So I've got to do something with line 1 to make it so I can combine them. So the first thing I'm going to try is turning it into an implication. So hypothetical syllogism is my very favorite rule because I like to get rid of things. Now I still can't, I still can't com combine 5 and 6 because I can't match up a hypothesis with a conclusion. So I can though if I swap the order of the implication in line 6. Using what rule? Contrapositive. Yes, I just did a double negation. Yes, I skipped double negation. So if I combine my 5 and 7, I'm getting something probably totally useless. So sometimes when we follow kind of the idea of finding my variable and then getting rid of other stuff, we don't get where we want. Because what I actually want is A on a line by itself, right? So it's, it's not working out yet. So if I was doing this at home, exactly like I'm doing it now, because I didn't have it already worked before I stood in front of you, I'd say, hmm, I don't really like this because I don't think this is getting me an A. Yes. How did I get 8? I combined 5 and 7 and hypothetical syllogism. You're right. I did not. I did something totally illegal. Well, in any way, in any case, it was illegal and it wasn't getting me anywhere. This will happen to you a lot because you're new at doing proofs. 
right? So one of the things that when I'm working a proof that might happen is I might have used all the lines and thought, okay, I'm stuck. I can't do anything else. Sometimes we have to use lines again. That's why I'm doing problem four because this is one that trips people up because we do have to use the lines again. Now, the first thing I recommend is if you get to this spot when you're working a proof, do it by contradiction. Let's do it. It's much easier for this problem. And then we'll come back to doing it by direct proof. So I say, hmm, I don't like what, where this is going. It's too messy. So let's actually do it by contradiction. So I write down a knot and I copy down what I'm trying to prove. And the reason is negation of conclusion. Now, if this is unsatisfying to you, I'm sorry. But this is what will happen to you when you're trying to work some proofs. You say, hmm, I can't really get this. Now, what I just did is I said, I'm probably going to spend 38 minutes on this and not get anywhere. Let's actually try another method. This is what we do when we do proofs. So proofs are one of those things. The reason why people hate them is because there's no guaranteed way of just doing them. But proof by contradiction will always work with something you can prove. So if you're not getting anywhere with direct proof, try it by contradiction. Okay, so we put not A, and again, we're looking for a contradiction. So I'm going to try to combine some, not A with the givens. Remember that we treat that like money, and the givens like the store. We're going to see what we can buy with not A. The simplest thing I can buy quickly is not C. And that was from 3 and 4 and modus tollens. So I've used that. Um, not C is still money because I did use the negation and conclusion to get it. So now I'm going to see what I can get with that. Oh, looks like on line 2 I can get B with 2 and 5 and disjunctive syllogism. Now there's this pesky or in the way, so I can't just put the B or the C in here. So that's the next thing that people like to do is, oh, I have B, so I can just get rid of B implies C and put C. That is not legal. Okay, so the thing that's not legal is writing this. So this is my illegal application of modus ponens. Why is that illegal? There's an or on the line one, so I'm not simply oring, I'm not simply anding B with B implies C, because B implies C might not be true. It's in an or statement with something else. Now, this actually is true. It's just that modus ponens won't give us that. I'd have to have a rule that actually let me take an or statement with another variable and combine it exactly the way we did. And we don't have any rules that do that. So this is wrong. I cannot get this with just one step. I can get it, but it needs more than one step. And we can't do, the, do anything with not C either with that one. But I do have four. So we already used it, but I can use it again. So with four, I can combine that with line one and get rid of that irritating A. Right? That A is what's my problem. If I can get rid of it, then I can do all kinds of yummy stuff. Right, we're going to get rid of it. So we get B implies C, combining one and four, and disjunctive syllogism. And now we can do six and seven and modus ponens the way we want. And it was only one more step, so... Your clever brains are going to jump around and want to do stuff, but the rules don't let you do them. But it doesn't take that long to get to what you want. So it's okay to make a wish and then figure out how the rules get you there. So just like, you know, you might know exactly how to drive from here to the beach, but you need to take a road that your car can go on. Okay? Just for doing these proofs, you might actually in your brain know that something's true, but you need to use the rules to get that. But it's very cool that your brain knows something that's true. It is very cool. You just need to use the rules to get there. Okay, so we get C from uh, combining B and B implies C. Now we have C and not C. So we're done almost with our proof. So we have line 5 has not C and line 8 has C. So we're going to do conjunction with those two. And line 10, this is a contradiction. And I don't need to give a rule, but the rule that you do have on your web assignment whenever you have one of these is Rule 26. And the reference line is 9.
So Rule 26 says that anything anded with itself is false. And that's called the contradiction rule, which is why it's weird to have a reason for that. So regular people don't usually write that down. We just had to fill something out on the web assignment. Any questions about this, by contradiction? So the tricky thing there was having to use something again and also not applying a rule just because we know something's true. So you know something's true, then figure out how to derive it with your rules. Don't magically wish that a rule actually matches when it doesn't. Any questions before we go back and try to do it directly? Okay, so what I'll probably do here is now maybe I need to rearrange what's on here and um, figure out what to do with that. So I'm going to use the implication rule to change that or into that implication into an or. Okay, I have um, a C here. I have C implies A there. So I might be able to get rid of the C if I rearrange this and have some stuff implies C. So let's try that. We have A or not B. We can do associative because there's two ors there. So 8 and associative, we'll put those things together. And then if I want to change that into an implication so I can combine it with uh, 3, I have to negate the first part, change the or to an implication, and copy down the second part. That was from 9 and the implication rule. We can go both ways on the implication rule. So if I start out with an or, I can change it to an implication. If I start out with an implication, I can change it to an or. The only implication rule, by the way, on the Deep Thought Tutor is the one that changes implications into ors. So there's a couple on your rule sheet that let you change them into negated ands and things like that, they don't work on, uh, on the Deep Thought Tutor. So you only get one implication rule, which is the one I always use in class, which is changing implications into ors. All right, so now I can combine line 10 with line 3. Okay, that's more promising because I'm, I'm getting, I still have A on there. So let's do 3 and 10 and hypothetical syllogism. Okay, we might have something with that. So let's actually change all of this back to ors and figure out what we have. So we have not, not A or not B or A if we change that back into an or with the implication rule. And that is just A or not B or A. That was from 12 and double negation. And can we simplify that? Yes, that is A or not B, right? Because if I or A or A together, I just get A. So I can rearrange it and or the A's together. So that's one of the idempotent rules. Uh, it's one of the ones that says that A or A equals A. Sorry, I forgot which one. That is. Okay, so that looks to me like B implies A. Yes. And line 5 has not B implies A. Right? So I could and... line 5 with line 6, I'm sorry, 15, and get there. But we're done with class. So see if you can finish that up, and we'll see you next time.